Hi everyone. Um, you probably won't see this slide, but it's okay. Just wanted to do something relaxing because let me tell you, I just had a quite a day, and it's Saturday, and uh, I'm kind of feeling in a mood of playing an interactive fiction game, if you can call it a game. I don't really want to turn this channel into a gaming one, <laughs> not that it's anything wrong with gaming, but something that I always really enjoyed ever since a kid, those small choose your adventure books where you're a time traveler or a cowboy. And um, one of the companies that does them these days very well, I think, is Choice of Games. And uh, Max Gladstone of uh, Three Parts Dead fame, a novelist, um, really, really good. Um, I guess you could call it urban fantasy slash steampunk fiction writer. He wrote an adventure for them. So it's called Choice of Deathless. And uh, it is kind of related to his, um, his universe, but let's get going. So this is Choice of Deathless by Max Gladstone. The sky over the demon world is broken. Lightning licks the strange geometries of cloud. Around you rises the demon city Akargath, warped crystal and flame, thorns and razor wire. And this is the nice part of town. Gods, you hurt. Your skin's a burned ruin. Bones in your ribs grind when you breathe. Your suit hangs in tatters from your body. Your enemy stands before you, a towering figure of glass and knives. Cackling madly, he raises one hand. Dark power crackles along his talents. Ooh, intimidating. The battle's taken almost all your strength. Your craft, your own power, stands at death. If you don't win this thing soon, you're done. So here is our first choice. What shall we do? Do we? Wait for the enemy to attack, then re redirect his power against him. Strike while we can and give no quarter or run and hide. So I guess this is sort of a character creation. First choice that will determine what kind of a character we are. So let's see. Um, let's see. What would I do? Well, wait for my enemy to attack, then redirect his power against him. I don't know if I'd do that. I'd probably either strike while I can and go all or nothing, or try to run and hide. But if I'm on the floor, hurt, and um, in tatters, I will go with striking right away okay you're strong stronger than this and you won't die here hooray or at least you won't die alone before he can attack you throw your power against him all the soul stuff you can summon merged into a single spear of coruscating light now in uh, gladstone's universe um, soul stuff is like a, it's like a currency. Um, essentially, his universe is imagine if necromancers are lawyers and gods are uh, have contracts with mortals. Mortals worship gods, and in return, they get they can power a city with energy or heat things like that it's very interesting so it's also used as yes as a energy source as currency it's essentially the most valuable thing so we summon all of the soul stuff we can and smite the attacker 
he staggers and falls to his knees. You advance, dragging your broken leg over the ground. Exquisite pain, but with one. You think, we think. Until he looks up and smiles, jagged teeth. Is that all? It was, that was the plan. What now? So do we talk to him, try to stall for time, pretend that we're going to bless him again, and then punch him in the face or spring my trap? Now, as much as I would like to have a trap ready, I don't think, <laughs> I don't think I'm the type of person to just carry a trap casually. So, what do we do? I think we try to stall. You scream into the whirlwind, others will come after me and after you. He laughs. Who? Who do you think cares enough about you to risk their life for vengeance? Mm. A. My friends. B. Someone named Ashley Wakefield. And C. My firm. Um, okay. So, are, am I a company man? Uh, I'm assuming that's a friend of mine, Ashley, or my friends. Or maybe it's someone I care about. I don't know. Honestly, probably my friends. My friends won't rest until they find you. And he answers, then they too will die. Okay. Oh, we died. Whoa. Well, that was short. <laughs> he closes his clawed hand into a fist. You crouch ready for the attack. He's powerful but arrogant. If you just hold out a few seconds more, you'll find some angle, some way to beat him. As long as you can keep it together. Then claws of light and power strike you and you shatter. Oh, so we're not completely dead. Okay. Your mind comes to pieces and pieces tumble, sharp and spitting. Seconds come unmoored from seconds. Shards catch and reflect images of a once familiar life, your past spinning out of reach. You have to fight back. You have to stop him. Defend yourself. It's so hard to think. What does thinking mean anyway, outside of time? You scramble amid the shattered, jagged faces of yourself. They cut your fingers and blood flows into memory. You must remember, you must fight. You are else. Who are you anyway? There must be an answer here. Amid the slivers and glass confetti, among the kaleidoscope shapes, if only you could grasp it. You don't even have hands with which to grasp, or a body for that matter. No, you have one, you remember. You are a, well, I am a man, so let's go. Your name, if you could remember it, names tie lives together, knit memories to memories, and your name is Jamie John Sawyer Mark something else. Oh, hi, Mark. I feel like I'm Mark. That's only part of it. Mark, Kang, Gaspard, Cavendish, Bly, Shepard. None of these. Cavendish sounds posh, so let's go with that. How did you get here, Mark? So many alternative pasts, so many options, dream shard, timepieces, childhood. The first stirrings of power. You caught a falling star in a dead field and held it burning in your hands. Smelled the sweet iron of space and the world's heat as fiery fingers crawled over your skin and into your flesh. Okay. No, that's a... That's a choice, all right. Either I closed my hands around the star I released the star into the sky, I ate the star, I watched the star as it died. Well, I'm probably, since 
I don't know, I like animals, and not that the star is an animal, but I guess if I were a kid and saw it, something like that, I'd try to release it. The star twisted lifelike in your grip. You raised your hands and opened your fingers and offered it to the star. Burning with hidden wings, it rose and spread, and rising spread more until it shone triumphant in the dark. You closed your eyes, but saw the star still, and more by its light, a vast net of souls in exchange, a pulsing network of life and story and bargain and consequence. Every note of web whispered to every other, as one they sang. You passed out, but when you woke, that vision remained, your first sight of a deeper world. You would sing one day, with that world, with the stars. But first, you had to grow up, and growing up presented its own challenges. You were... Hmm. Comfortable, maybe? Okay. A merchant's child, supported and loved. You were the product of your family's dreams, and of their determination to rebuild after the God Wars decimated grandfather's business. From the first day you showed interest in the craft, your destiny was never in doubt. And craft here is capitalized because the series of books by Max Gladstone is called The Craft Sequence. Uh, major recommendation. You are bound for the hidden schools to learn sorcery. Okay. You developed in those conditions from child to man. Here's a cunning tumbling chart of lips and the skin. First kiss. A girl I knew. Okay. What else? Ah, a bright afternoon. A brief rest. A, a pressure of lips and hands and bodies. Neither one of you was very good at kissing. Or anything else you tried. But it was a start. And it was sweet. Oh, uh, do you remember the first time by, what was it, uh, Pulp, I think, has a good song about that. You wonder what became of her. You'll never know. More flashes from your years in the hidden schools where you studied the dark arts man called Croft. A century ago, you would have burned at the stake for learning those skills. How to raise the dead from their graves. How to hold the power of the gods in your own hands. Then the god wars happened and humans won. The hidden schools rose in your defiance of... What was it? Of divine authority. And life became a lot better for people who chose to twist natural law into their whims. People like you. Aha. You see, you remember. Okay, let's see. Hours and hours of studying, sweating, bent at my desk. Keg stands and drunken revels, dancing, flesh, and joy. The gym, the track. Books when I had to, but always the field. Sneaking through and around the rules. Hmm. That seems... These choices are very cut and dry, I think. I mean, me personally, I did all right at the school. Um, I was like a solid B student all my life. Um, so, I mean, you could apply hours and hours of studying, but uh, it wasn't always like that. And the gym, the track, not really. Um, I like working out, I like exercise, but I don't consider that, I guess, I guess it is sports, but I never liked um, group sports. I mean, I, I enjoyed playing basketball, okay, yeah, I did that, but uh, especially at university, but it's always was just working out individually, and keg stands and drunken rebels I, I mean, I'd go out from time to time, but uh, I wasn't much of a party animal. So maybe let's go sneaking through around the rules. Maybe that will be interesting. 
You climb the sevenfold tower in a thunderstorm to see the light that played among its many times. What you saw there you never told a single soul. Professors warned you to stay within the rules, not to meddle in matters you lack the context to comprehend. Yet, you are the first in your class to wake a corpse from slumber. So this sounds like someone who had uh, good improvisational skills, natural curiosity, maybe not what's considered to be academic leanings, but a, still a passion for, for the craft. Both lowercase and uh, uh, high case craft. So, nobody tied that to you though, at least not officially. You learned the hidden names of Professor Helsia, and you found six of the seven immaterial volumes of the Great Library. You think you caught a glimpse of God, or a God at least, in the outer reaches of the astral plane, once. You are probably a bit unhinged, oh. But if you weren't, but damned if you weren't unhinged in style. The hidden schools were a realm of darkness and study, but no one ever accused the students of the students there of monastic discipline. What pleasures did you indulge in? What loves? What faces? What bodies reflecting the holy shards of what used to be your soul? Oh, poetic. There was no time for love. I discovered that I loved men. I wanted women and found women who wanted me. Yeah, that, that uh, sounds right. Uh, let's go. They were strong, they were brittle, they were brilliant, they were short-sighted, they were beautiful, they were unformed. In short, they were young and so were you. But the process was fun for all involved. And then you graduated and went to work. Oh yes, way to remind me. Okay, let's see. Creek Tower rises like a black needle over sprawling Shikoa skyline. To the east stretches the great water, slate gray, broken by white chalk line waves. Below and off to the west, broad gridded streets map the earth between buildings the size of city blocks. And beyond these lie older red brick neighbors that never quite recovered from the god wars. Varkath Nebuchadnezzar stone occupies the top 20 floors of Creek Tower. Your new office, your first office ever, is a cubby on floor 35, toward the lower bound of VNS territory. It's empty, but for you and the few personal possessions you're moving in, a single box piled high with crop food books and on top of them a few teetering personal effects, including a, wow, that's a new word, de gurotype, the gurotype of your graduation. What's a de gurotype? Is it like a diploma of some kind? Maybe the box that holds a scroll of a diploma? You look so proud. You set the box down and sag into your chair. You hear the subtle shift in the box and turn in time to see the picture fall. I catch it with the craft. I catch it with my hands. Why catch it? More interesting to fix it with the craft once it's broken. Now this is an interesting choice. It does seem a bit mundane, but uh, there's something I wanted to discuss. So, I was thinking the other day about Harry Potter, about how, just how uh, selective the wizarding world is. So, it seems that the technology stopped at some point in time. And there are some contraptions that are not uh, powered by magic. So, what kind of person would I be if I were a wizard? And I think that I would try and limit myself 
Not because I think, you know, blessing magic is immoral or something, or like in this situation. I try to limit myself just to discipline myself. I don't want to become too comfortable. It's like finding a job and being so incredibly on autopilot while you're working and then something happens and you no longer have this job and you have to find another job and you just relax too much on the previous job and you can't up quite quite can't um, keep, up, keep up the tempo mentally you are not in, in a good shape so I think I very much try to catch it with my hands not because I am I'm comfortable with using magic but because I think that I want to be up to my game so I catch it with my hands you sweep a hand out and grab the picture before it hits the ground but you've misjudged your own strength, your thumb breaks the glass, and you feel a sudden stab of pain. Oh well, uh, so much about being uh, one with the mind and the body. So what do we ex what do we exclaim? Shit, hells, God damn it! No, yeah, I don't think I would exclaim all that much. I'm not a big, as, big on swears in real life. Not that I think there's anything wrong with swearing, I just, it's, it never became a habit. No big deal, I bandage my thumb and get on with my life. Yeah. You wrap your thumb in tissue paper to stem the bleeding, which should help. You hear a knock on the door and a second later it opens to admit Kesoweri Chen, another first year associate at Varkov Nebuchadnezzar Stone. She started a week ago, same as you, and for both of you, the last seven days have been a solid wall of training. She's born at 12, better than you, than you feel you have. Like you, Cass wears a dark gray skirt suit. She's intense, 5 foot 5 or so, dark hair, expressive features, given to sharp broad gestures with her hands while talking. She glances down at your thumb with concern. Are you okay, Mark? So what do we say? Oh, it's nothing. We say, I thought this place could use a little more color. Do we say, HR sent a few more forms for me to sign? Do we say, no, actually this hurts a lot. Or do we say, what are you doing here? I'm definitely not saying, no, actually this hurts a lot. Not because I'm some kind of a indestructible Strong man, but uh, it's, yeah, I cut my finger like anyone does. It's my fault. It's not like a shelf fell on me. So yeah, I'd say it's nothing. And change the subject. You mean? She looks skeptical. Nothing, huh? Well, anyway, she says. Ben and I thought we might meet for dinner before this casino night orientation thing. Pre-game a little. You want to come? What do we say? Do we say, I'd love to? You're going to that? I thought I might skip. It's just more social, play nice stuff, right? That? Why not just two of us? Eh, I'll eat by myself. Have fun. Well, hmm, I guess I'd describe myself as an introvert, but uh, I'd actually like when my extroverted friends call me to go out somewhere, I usually do. I never initiate because I like staying at home, hanging out with my dog, with my guitar and stuff, but uh, or reading. That's what I mostly do. So I'd probably say I'd love to. Um, the third question, the third answer. Why not just two of us? That would imply interest in this character. I would never do that. I actually kind of pride myself with not ever, ever uh, mixing private life with work. I mean, even back even at 
university. I, I wouldn't even date people from my year because I just never want to complicate my life. It's complicated enough. So yeah, I'd love to. Uh, great, she shoots you a thumbs up and scribbles down the address of a bar not far from Casino Night. We'll meet there at 7, okay? Then she's gone in a flare of jacket and skirt and clicking on heels. If you want to meet her by 7, you'd, be you'd best get home and have some work to do. Okay. You're still living out of boxes and it would be nice to stop that one of these days. You have barely enough time to get home and pack a little and return. Lucky for you that it's still the first week of training. In a month, once the work picks up, you doubt you'll ever again see a sunset that's not filtered through glass. Too many dead men to be raised, gods to be wrestled, laws a reality to be violated. You know, the usual life of a craftsman. Home wait, go for now. And where is home, anyway? Friends hire close to the office. But the closer you are, the shorter the commute, and short commutes mean more sleep, which makes everything in life easier. So, where is home? As close as I can get to the office, damn the expense. I try, try to compromise between price and convenience. The cheapest digs I can find, I won't spend much time there anyway. Well, for me, I guess I would go for the middle, because you do really feel miserable if your commute is super long and I've had long commutes in the past and it's not fun because you miss out on so much and those hours after work are so precious and uh, you do really need them and if you spend it driving around or sitting in the train like I used to do, it's, it's not fun. So let's go with that. A trolley takes 20 minutes to escape the steel and glass titans of downtown and reach the brownstones and bricks of the garment district, which, so far as we've been able to determine, has nothing whatsoever to do with garments or the textile industry these days. Not for the first time you wonder if you should have tried to find a job near to the place you grew up, where you knew the history and the territory. But in this business, you go where the work is. You were lucky to get a chance at Barkov Nebuchadnezzar, the markets as harsh as it has been in years. Interesting. Speaking of rent and commutes and similar topics, what kind of life are you living exactly? By which I mean, when you left the hidden schools to embark on this path of high thaumaturgy, you were carrying about uh, 150,000 tomes in debt. Currently, your soul is only worth about 2,000. Your salary is about 160,000 tomes. Or, yeah, let's say 100,000 after all of your various fees and obligations to the city of Shikor handled. Debt is obviously debt. The hidden schools lay claim to your soul and all of its future products. As long as you carry this debt, you'll never be free. Mad necromancers, necromancers can and will hunt you to the ends of the earth. So, that said, how much of your salary after you take care of the rent and living expenses goes towards debt? And how much of it is yours to spend? Yeah, I'd go with, with the middle. Because the quality of life does matter. I, I'd burn out if you know if I couldn't buy something. Not not luxury, but I'm I'm a frugal person. But every once in a while, buying something for for my family would be nice. So let's go with next. Your apartment is a mess. Of, uh, is a mess of boxes. Piles by the floor, in the hall, in the center of the room. You have a bed and pillows, but that's the limit. Everything else is cardboard and packing tape. You glance ruefully at your watch, set down your briefcase and start unpacking. At this rate, you might have time to do something other than unpack and go to firm functions sometime around two months from now. 
though that's an optimistic state. Estimate, sorry. You manifest a knife out of your soul stuff and start tearing open boxes. You'd have used something more prosaic, but your knife and scissors are of course bad. Classic. Sounds like me, actually. <laughs> you haven't looked at your watch in a while when you hear a knock on the door. Answering it, chain in place, of course, you discover to your surprise, Ashley Wakefield. You haven't seen Wakefield since graduation. You sort of hoped never to see her again. Ash Wakefield of Southern Wakefield, the scion of a high family, and everyone in the hidden schools knew it. Affluent, blonde, brilliant, and sculpted out of marble, metaphorically. Though you never got close to check. Kellatris, Elbrecht and A.O., one of the mo world's most prestigious craft firms, hired Wakefield straight out of the hidden schools as an associate in their Chicot office, and she made certain everyone knew. Perhaps she was just excited. That'd be a charitable way to look at it. Cavendish, she says. It's been quite a while since we're both going to this party. I decided I might as well visit another lonely and bereft graduate in this dismal city. Whoa. Now that's a person full of themselves. <laughs> it doesn't seem right to keep Wakefield waiting outside, so you undo the lock on the door, step aside and let her in. She glances around the piles of boxes without betraying the slightest hint of the same. Wakefield conveys the stain quite well enough without having to betray it. Yeah, I can picture it. How did you get this address? See anything you like? I'm a bit busy, if you don't mind. I knew I should have shut the door in your face. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think I'd go neutral with how did you get this address? I prevailed, she says, upon your alumni office, said I wanted to help grow the hidden schools community in Chico. Do you? We'll see. Uh, Wakefield turns on her heels to face you and spreads her arms wide. I came to invite you to dinner. I have been forced to attend this particular brand of interfirm madness and drinks in the vaguest cues <laughs> and for intelligent conversation might provide an appropriate stimulant for early evening. So do we say, I have plans. I'm meeting some friends for dinner, you're welcome to come, against my better judgment, let's, so I can be a warm up bout of a drink, no thanks. Yeah, I don't, I wouldn't ever ditch my friends, so if someone invites me, and I already have plans, I'd invite them to come with me if I knew that my friends wouldn't mind, and usually they don't, so let's go with that. Flattering, Wakefield says, much as I would relish being immersed in your social pool, and from her tone of voice you can tell she means the shallow kind with cadales around the edge, a vague green scum on top and a pleasant stench hanging up. I shall keep my own company, another time perhaps, another time you say, and escort her to the door. You arrive at the horseshoe a few minutes after seven and shoulder your way through a barside crowd past the hostess stand into the dining area. Fortunately, you see Cass before the hostess catches up with you. She half stands, waves and smiles. That turns too and smiles even broader, but doesn't stand, doesn't wave. He's a big guy, a slow mover, but smart. Older than you and Cass too, old for an associate dignified, short curly hair, dark skin, Ishkari cuffs on his pressed shirt. He has a family even, from what you've heard, a wife at home and a kid on the way. The waitress swings by, what will you have? A beer, wine, <laughs> whiskey straight up, the manliest cocktail your bar bartender can man up to make, an apple teeny or tea. Well, I don't know about the manliest, but me personally, I like mojitos. I'm not much of a cocktail person, but I do like a mojito. Uh, wine? Occasionally, yeah. Whiskey? Uh, I'm not that well versed into 
bourbon and whiskey. Uh, a colleague of mine uh, got me into uh, Jim Beam with Cocon Ice last year, and that's not bad. I don't know if Jim Beam is considered good by the connoisseurs, but I liked it. So maybe just go with. Yeah, wine is fine. I'll get right on that, says the bartender. You drink and eat and talk, and before long the conversation turns as it always does to work. This time the subject is golds, and specifically Cass Chen's lack of them. I don't know, she says. Working for the firm develops skills and connections and all that. But in the end, so much of what we do is abstract tomaturgics. It doesn't connect to people, to human lives. What does it matter if a concern recognizes an extra percent of profit? To the many who work for that concern, but in Gabi Repli's, an extra percent of profit or a fraction of it might matter a great deal. And regardless, we must think of our own lives and careers before we ponder abstract injustice. It is enough, I think, to care for our families and for those close to us. When the world's suffering, Chen shakes her head. What do you think, Mark? What do you want out of your work with the firm? So, I want to make a partner. I'd like to give something back to the world, if I can. As long as, it's, as they keep giving me interesting work, I'll do it. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I always wanted to amass infinite power and laugh over the corpses of, of my enemies. That last one sounds like... Conan, what is the best in life? To crush your enemies, see them driven before you, and hear the limitation of their women. That is good. That is good, Conan. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm going to take it as a humorous response, so let's go with that. A traditionalist, says Pat with a wild smile. I'm not joking, Chen says. Neither am I. You try to keep a straight face, but can't manage it for long. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I guessed it right. It was a humorous response. She wads a napkin up and throws it at you. I, Pat says, will make a partner. Once I have established a place for myself and my family in the city, then my children can concern themselves with personal gratification, not to mention this nebulous giving something back, with which Cassavery seems so concerned. Now you're just being mean, Cass says. And it's not like I don't want to succeed. I just think there's more we're supposed to do here then try to get as big as we can until we explode. Pat raises his beer in a salute. Bigger is better. You know what I mean, Cass says. Not really. The conversation spins on for a while, but time's wasting and you're all more than fashionably late already. You will get the check and head out to the casino night. Okay. Barkat Nebuchadnezzar, Kelatris, Albert and AO and a few other firms have rented out a swanky waterfront restaurant. A chandelier dangles from thin gold chains over rooms, swarming with craftsmen and craftswomen, clad in pinstripes and slick silk. Cocktail glasses clink, dice thud and roll over green felt tables. Everywhere you hear the flushed bird sound of shuffled cards. Outside and overhead, a few stars have survived the onslaught of the city lights. They glitter over the black waters of the lake. Hmm. You wander the floor for a moment and take everything in and score a drink from the bar. When you turn back, you take inventory of the room. The ever practical pet Ngabi is playing blackjack, the best odds on the floor given perfect play. Guess Chen flits from conversation to conversation. She's on her second cocktail of the night, not counting her dinner's drinks. This may not end well for her. Ashley Wakefield should be milling with the rest of the KAA crowd, standoffish and superior as always, but she's not. You find her at one of the poker tables, seated next to... Oh, gods. That's skeleton in green with the hands of cold iron and the glyphs burning of the pate of his bared skull and the mask of cured leather. That's Golan Varkov, as in 
named partner Golan Barka. You see him his portrait, but you've never seen him in person before. So, what do you do next? Mill around for a while, talk to pe people, try to network with senior partners. I want to win all of all the souls I can. Find the true test of my mental fortitude. I head straight for the poker table. Well, I'm definitely not heading straight for the poker table. I'm terrible at poker. I can barely play it, so no. I'm also not the biggest fan of gambling. So, what does a true test of my mental fortitude mean? I want to win all the souls I can. Uh, try to... Well, let's mill around for a while, talk to people. You wander for the duration of a drink, chatting with co-workers and advisors. You exchange a few pleasant words with Vega, a senior associate on a fast track to promotion or destruction within throws of craps. You catch up with Cass briefly before she risks off on her own version of social dance. Before long, you can sense the beating heart of the party, under the core and elegance. There are real people here, which is nice. What do you do? I guess let's try to network. There are plenty of impressive people at this party, and you manage to exchange a few words with some of them, but most are talking with other impressive people. Most of the higher-up guests seem more interested in mingling than gaming. Perhaps this entire casino night concept was a ploy to draw Warcat out of his sanctum for once. Pat notices you orbiting a conversation in which Angelica Nebuchadnezzar is arguing about the proper preconditions for the resurrection of a dead god with a partner from KAA you don't recognize. Pat raises your glass in salute, recognizing a fellow traveler. You salute back, notice your drinks empty and retreat to the bar. So what do you do next? I guess we can't escape. What is this true test? Uh, roulette, craps, several variations of blackjacks, taroko, sparrows, and of course poker. Let's rule out the roulette first as a game of pure chance with odds in the house's favor. It's only here because people like the sound of, of the wheel. Craps, arcane betting aside, is a less a game of the mind than a game of the dice. Blackjack has structure and one can win, but over a long period of time, and then only if one's quite careful. Taroko, well, you then have that kind of time. You never learn sparrows, pro from what you've given to understand. It's something like gin, only with tiles. Which brings you back to poker and Varka and Wakefield. Oh well, stealing their souls probably won't get you into much trouble at work. Probably. Guess there's no turning back now. You join Varka, Wakefield, and a few other monsters at the table. The goddess of the game hovers about the felt, shifting and glorious, calling each player in turn to his or her destruction. Ooh, no sense waiting, just sit down. Wakefield looks up from the cards. Decided to button up your trousers and play in the big leagues? Oh, let's, what shall we say? Shame you can play as good a game as you talk. I wanted to give you a head start and a chance. To the rest of the table, has she been this bad all night? I say nothing, yet let the dealer deal me in. Oh, I don't think I would say, has she been this bad all night to the higher ups and people I don't know. I'm not the kind of person to become too familiar with people. So, um, let's go with a cheeky answer, because we know Wakefield, so. Warcraft says nothing, neither does anyone else. The big blind is the is a craftswoman who's replaced her skin with scales, and a little blind spark. You glance at your cards when the bed comes around you and breaks. What's your plan for the evening? I'm here to talk, I want to win, I want to get Wakefield, I want to beat Varkav, and I want to taste as many souls as I can and see what I can learn. Yeah, this might be a learning experience, I don't really want to get her. 
Here's the thing about playing poker. Every time you bet, a portion of your soul flows into the goddess in the center. It doesn't leave until you fold or until you lose, which means that if you're careful and you go in a lot, you might be able to feel the contours of other players' souls. Who knows what you might be able to learn? So you throw yourselves into the game, not because you want to win, but because you want to know. Huh. Okay. Okay. Um, let's go. But what is there to know? The pot's an angry royal of soul stuff and ambition. Conflicting dreams and deadly will. You try to mix yourself with their mind. But how and why? You're torn and tossed in the tempest of your fellows, players' minds. And in the end, you're drawn too deep. You bite on a bad play and then the world goes grey. That's the night's big play for you. You're not dead, nor, you, you, nor you're so far reduced as to qualify for zombiehood, but you feel low and bruised. When the game breaks up and the goddesses dissolve, dissolves back to the players from whose souls she was formed, you're only too happy to push yourself away from the game and stagger off towards the bar. Before you travel far, though, you hear a voice behind you, harsh and melodic in weird direction. Like a house key scraped over a violent strain. Now that's an image, that's an mental image. Mr. Cavendish. A pleasure to play with you. You turn and see Varka. Hmm. Sir, his mask is painted to resemble a young man's face. Perhaps his from a long vanished youth. You think the mask's made of cowhide. You, fer you fervently hope it's made of cowhide. Next time, try to achieve what you set out to do. So, yeah. Uh, do we say, I'll remember that, sir? Better to experiment in a casino than in the courtroom, sir. Some people are never happy. Or do we say, what were you hoping to see? Well, let's try with that. Some spark, he says, and turns away. You feel exhausted. Long day, long night, and more long days to come. Many more of them, if this life works out the way you've planned. Chen and Pat are talking at the edge of the dance floor. They look like they're ready to go. Meanwhile, the dance itself is heating up and you see some people that you wouldn't mind heating up as well. And there's always the bar, not to mention your bed, though it seems so far away now. Uh, I catch up with Chen and Gabi and walk them to the trolley. The night is young, I try to drag Chen and Gabi out for drinks. Let's see what we can do on that dance floor, shall we? Or we get some rest. I think we'd catch up with our friends and go. You walk your fellow associate to the trolley. Pat won a reason of Pat won a decent amount of soul at blackjack. And while cast in gamble, she bit out of it from the booze. You're parked at hub station, friends under the streetlight. And when you're finally reach your apartment, you fall into bed like a piece of broken glass. A memory tumbling, spinning forever in the night. Interlude. Broken. Ooh, let's see. The image slips and fades, but the blood remains. You are more than you were, or at least you remember more than once you remember. You're still falling in pieces in this darkness from which you cannot return. More sparks and slivers of falling memory tumble around you. You grope still for memories, for changes. You passed your first year at the firm. Little decisions altered your world world day by day what changes do you grab out of the cascading broken mirrors uh yeah i don't think we change anything and so you reach for another shard of your spinning mind another reflection of a screaming face you barely recognize as your own you stand in a dark room inside of a glowing pentacle and hold a knife of lightning to your wrist Somewhere a clock strikes midnight. It's time to work, as always. You press the knife, pointing to your vein. A drop of blood wells up, you pull the blade away, and the blood drop falls round and reflective to the floor. And when it splashes there, you fall too. You fall into the world of gods. The material realm breaks around you, and for a moment, you feel 
yourself an act passing for a beam of light revealed to enormous beings who normally would not notice something so small. In this instant exposure, they might well reach out and destroy you for their own amusement or only to pass the time. You leave the light and find your destination. You hover before a wall woven by spiders out of silver webs. Most of the patterns are abstract, but a few resemble faces, the faces of people you know, screaming. Ha! Huh. This has been the last three months of your life. Transdimensional Tomaturgics, your client, contracted with the demonic consortium of Akargat to build an enormous hydro project in the southern Catholic jungle. The demons then claimed the project was uh, as much their property as TVs, which would give them a foothold in your world, a territory through which they could pass at will from their reality to yours, unlimited by the bonds of a summoning contract. They would stride across the earth like gods. Obviously, this is a bad outcome. You've been tasked with document review and minor war maintenance. How have you been handling these responsibilities? I've worked late every day on my own. I've searched for patterns in the demon strategy, trying to work smarter. I've created an elaborate piece of craft to do most of the work for me. I'm working in a team with my colleagues. Probably go with number three. The system you've conjured isn't particularly smart, but it can crawl over the massive wall web of the contract, searching for weaknesses you've defined, which in turn leaves your mind and time free for other work. You spend hours coming through the contract wall, comparing it point by point to the written descriptions of the deal transdimensional thaumaturgics offered you. This is a bigger version of the classic summoning contract, in the same way a container ship is a bigger fishing boat. The principle is the same, at least. Demons hail from a realm parallel to your own. Local laws of physics don't bind them. When offering demons a path into your own reality, a good summoner can define their powers to exceed those of most humans. But if demons could pass into your world without a clear contract, they would lack limits. Singularities of possibility striding unrestrained across continents. And singularities are bad. A few demons were unleashed back during the God Wars, and the world still shudders from the consequences. So you review the deal again, and again, and at 3 o'clock in the morning you say the words no one connected with the craft or ever wants to say or hear. Huh, that's funny. You barely trust your own eyes. Fortunately you have another pair to hand. Kaz Chen is also working late. Hey Kaz, can you take a look at this? She flies over her portion of the wall. These last few months haven't worn well on Kaz. She has dark circles under her eyes and her face looks strained. What's the problem? You show her. There's a hole in the wall, a tiny hole, but demons don't need much room to wriggle through. We need to tell someone about this, she says. You nod and rise into the real world. You stumble back into your own skin. Flesh fits tight after freedom, and your wrist hurts like hell. Mouth dry, world whirling, you turn for the door. Have to grope twice in the dark to find the handle. You wander down the ghostlit hallway outside, looking for someone, anyone. Soon you find Vega, Halcyon Vega e Alatriste. Elegant, tall, slim, dark-eyed, ambitious, lengthy of counsel, and a rapid climber in the fur. He's in charge of the warding project, amongst other things. He seems shaken, perhaps to look on your face. What happened? I found something, we found something, I lied, nothing's wrong. What's wrong with you? You look tense. I probably, I'm a team player, I'd say we found something. There's a hole in the web, you say. It looks like the contract isn't as complete as we thought. You didn't think his brow could furrow much deeper. Does it look like the demons know? No. We'll bring it up at the morning meeting, he says. And Mark, good job. Get some rest, okay? You could use some too. 
Yeah, that's what I say. Rest, he says. The world the way some people say heaven. When I'm dead, maybe. Or when the case is over, whichever comes first. You leave him, this worried, haunted man, in the hallway and go home yourself to sleep. The next morning you meet the client in, in the nightmare. It's a straightforward nightmare as these things go. An immersed scaly thousand footed beast lies belly up and the table rests on a stretch of his stomach. You and the others sit on the beast's upturned feet. Everyone's here. Damien Stone, the name partner in charge of the case, a heavy, dark craftsman in his late 60s. Vega, in pressed suit jacket. Cas Chen, you. Not to mention the client himself, an executive of transdimensional thaumaturgics. A thin, pale man in a black suit. You know him only as John Smith. The world warps around him and the stuff of nightmare bends. The meeting wheels through old business to new. Smith watches with cold black eyes and seems almost bored. Not at all as if your work is the only barrier between his firm and demonic invasion. At last, Stone clears his throat, leans towards in his chair, cracks his knuckles and asks if anyone has new business. In fact, Vega says, Last night, I discovered a weakness in the contract, a minor hole related somehow to the definition of ownership. I'll send you the details. We will need any documents you can provide connected with this matter. Of course, Smith says. Smith's words is so ordinary you don't much hear his words so much as assume them. I'll have the documents sent. And that's all. Not, no mention of your discovery, no mention of Cass. Across the table, you see Chen swale with French. Vega's taking your thunder, and hers as well. She opens her mouth. Okay. Let's see. Fun. Do we stay silent? Let's cast hang and try to distract her. I think we try to distract her. But she's interrupted by a crash as you knock your water glass off the table. It shatters on the beast's stomach and the table shakes as the creature groans and rolls in its sleep. Everyone turns to you and you apologize profusely. As the others return to business, you should cast in an unmistakable glare. She sees and stops, though she doesn't look happy. The nightmare ends, and you, Vega, Stone, and Cass wake in the 40th floor conference room. Vega stands, brushes off his jacket, and excuses himself quickly. Cass rises flushed, obviously strung, struggling to keep herself under control. She rounds the table, but before she can reach you, someone speaks. Mr. Cavendish, I find myself desiring coffee. Would you care to accompany me? It's stone, and from what you know of partners, this doesn't sound like a request. Of course, sir. yeah, yeah, we go with that. Excellent, shall we? He motions you ahead of him. As you return to, you see Cass disappear around the corner. She's obviously upset. What else? What else were you supposed to do? She's the name. Uh, she's a uh, stone's name is on the front door. Oh, I need, I need some coffee. <laughs> stone leads you out of the building into sunlight and cool autumn wind. You try unsuccessfully to remember the last time you were out during the day. Mystic circles and demonic invasions have become normal to you than the sun. Stone stops at Muerte Coffee, a few blocks away. There's a line straight to the door, and two of you wait there, not talking. By your estimates of Stone's billing rate, the 10 minutes it takes you to reach the counter would cost something on the order of 3,000 photos. You get your coffee to go. Stone takes a right of the shop bar and leads you further from the office. When he turns the corner, he says without preamble, so what do you think of Mr. Vega? Yeah, well, he's a good man, ambitious. He tried to take credit for my work. I don't think of him, or what do you think of him? 
Uh, well, I'm not the type of person to interrupt when someone takes my thunder, but if asked, I would not hesitate. So I'll go with that. You're honest, I see. Most people won't be with me. I don't want to waste your time. Or mine, I say. Vega, Stone says, is Nebuchadnezzar's protege. Her pet associate, recently raised to council. He wants to join the partnership. This is his first big case. He says this flatly, without accent or anger. And yet, you came the thought that out of the three senior partners, Stone's the one, Stone's the one whose name gets left out when Pressman named the firm in casual conversation. And the book of the Nazar, well, her name is left in. Don't be afraid to defend your own work, Stone says, even if it means fighting dirt. Not everyone at the firm is entirely pleased with Vegas Majority Prize. I don't understand what you mean, sir. I don't understand what you mean, sir. But really, you do. I'll do my best to undercut him. Or do we say there's room enough at the top? So long as it doesn't keep us from serving the client. Hmm. Yeah, let's go with double meaning. Well then. He drains the rest of his coffee. There's not much left to discuss. Huh. Stone doesn't speak more on the way back to the office or in the elevator. You get off on your floor and turn to your office honoring the great conversation. Seems to you everyone's behaving like little kids in grammar school. Secret agendas, hidden plots, wheels within wheels, who likes who more, who's joking for what position. You thought serious people would be better than this. Must be possible to be a partner in a firm without admiring yourself in skullduggery, mustn't it? On the way to your office, you pass Cast Chance. She's pacing with a sheaf of papers in one hand, but she is not reading the papers. Her footsteps are heavy with anger. I should tell her to take care of herself. I should encourage her, help her learn to play the game, ask her what's wrong. I think I should encourage her. That's what brands are for, right? Her office's door is open. You slip through and wait patiently. She doesn't seem to notice your arrival, pacing back and forth. We'll be fine, you say, and she jumps. Did she really notice, not notice you were standing there? Vega just, just tries to play the game. She doesn't take long to overcome her surprise. She says, so we should just smile while these things are work, your work? Sometimes, for now. We're new at this, both of us. We need to learn the ropes first. Not jump in over our heads before we don't have deep deep water race. Caution, consideration, look before you leap. You sound like my father. I'm just trying to help. And it's the thought that counts, she asks. I hope so. She sighs. Vegas a jerk. He's a fine person, I think, just in a bad position. He certainly is that. We'll get the best of him somehow. Or do I say, don't worry about him, we can get through this? Yeah, I'll go with that. Together, huh? She looks at you for what feels like a long moment. Her eyes are dark, of course, you know that. But for some reason, you really notice it now. Together sounds good. Okay. You excuse yourself and return to your office, to your work. You sit down at your desk. Ponder your pen and your knife at the journeyman craft circle etched in the hardwood. How do you do your work, knowing all that you know? Now, I work harder on my own. I slack off, Vega will take the blame. I look for flaws in Vega's work. I work as closely with Chen as I can, save in numbers. Uh, I think I would... Yeah, go with that. You and Chen need one another. You check one another's work, you visit one another's offices when the question comes up. Neither of you claims responsibility for others' insights. Over time, you build an implicit trust, and the reputation is a good team, which you hope reflects good on you both. Three weeks into your ongoing review of Smith's documents, Cass takes a brief vacation. Her cousin's getting married. I'm so sorry, she says on her way out the door. I wish I could stay. Uh, no, you don't. I wish you could too. Get out of here like you missed this. Yeah. She laughs and leaves. 
You stay later than usual at evening, tying up loose ends. At 10 o'clock at night, you take a break and rise from the desk, leaving a bowl of blood to cool. Your joints creak and crack as you proceed to the break room. It's empty. Or so you think at first. Pour yourself coffee, sit with, make a face and turn. Move into the dark. You tense at first and recognize Vega. He leans against the table, coffee mug in hand. The perfect hair look, looks must, and there are lights on his face you didn't see before. He looks up. His eyes are vacant. He sees you, though. Mark, late night. I leave as fast as possible. I act friendly, I'll talk, but don't want to display much sympathy. Yeah, probably not. Late night, you say, and lean against the table beside him. But you know, if you can't stand the heat, stay out of hell. He laughs, bitterly. It's strange to be exposed, he says. You work and work, and at a certain point you realize that all your work only gives your enemies more chances to watch you fail. What do you mean by enemies? Tell him about my chat with Stone. Is that what you took credit for discovering the breach? You seem to be doing okay. Is there anything I can do to help? Yeah, let's confront him. He shakes his head. Whomever presented the breach was likely to be blamed, both by the partner and by the client for not discovering it earlier. It's not the way it matters. It's not the way matters should stand, but it's the way they do stand, more often than not. That, you say, is a kind gloss to put on the fact that you stole my work. I don't think it is gloss, but I may be wrong. You see what happens? One's instinct for self-preservation and self-advancement can become automatic. So an automatic that one must even doubt one's own good intent. You, back, you, walk, you walk back to your offices together in silence. The next day, a weekend, but you're in the office as usual. And as usual, the male golem shows up with two bearing packages from around the world. You receive nothing, but you do hear it scuttle on many legs into Cassie's office and set down a heavy package on her desk. When the golem's gone, you step into Cass's office and glance over the package. It's a thick document box marked with ID glyph of a transdimensional thaumaturgic's case. Several red urgent stamps glare at you from the sides. You open the box and after all you told Cass you would. And you rip and open the parcel, you feel the world grow a step darker, or possibly brighter. Something's here, you know it. You spread the papers out on Cass's desk and shuffle through them. Carbon copies of an executive whose name you don't recognize from the TT board lists you've memorized over the last few months. But none of it makes sense to you. Something's here, you're certain. If only you could find it. Ah, uh, yeah, let's go to Vega. Let's not be unreasonable. Vega's here working through the weekend like you and like always. You run breathless into his office, interrupting his drafting of summons and explain what you found. The pages for the context of the package and his face pales as he nears the end. That this is it, he says. Nothing complex, just a letter from a deposed executive which claims the dam is a joint project and says it will offer both our firms a foothold in the new territory. And that's all they need. If Akargat can claim Transdimensional presented the dam as a joint project, they might be able to push for joint ownership. And from there, he shudders. You have a sudden image of demonic hordes sweeping into the deep jung jungles of Southern Kaf to breed and grow fast. Uh, I don't know what we should do, he says. This is big and we need it fixed fast. We should call Stone. He seems reluctant. And you know why? Stone could use this as an opening to help him in his slow war against Vega. You don't know anymore whether that's a good thing. So let's stop there. We have three choices here. We should bring Stone into the loop. We can fix it together or let me do it myself. Uh, I think I'm going to stop here, but uh, if you're guys interested in this format, or if you have preferred time for streams, or if you're interested in doing this at all, uh, write into the comment section what would you do. So next time, if there is next time, uh, we'll continue. Okay? So, bye-bye.